Hey everyone, we launched a podcast this week. Our brand new project called Eureka Stories explores some of those Eureka moments, some of the best ideas from scientists all across the world. In addition to releasing the audio across all of your favorite podcast services, we're also releasing the audio and video here on YouTube, breaking up these long interviews into short palatable sections. We hope that you'll like this. Our first guest today is Bruce Spiegelman. He's the Stanley Korsmeyer Professor at Harvard Medical School and the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Our conversation ranges from his discoveries on the gene PGSU1 alpha to his systems that he has in place in order to discover and how he thinks about trajectories of science in order to build stories and bodies of knowledge. I hope you'll enjoy listening as much as I've enjoyed making these. Let's listen to what Bruce has to say. I was told more than once, why are you wasting your time on this? You could be working on lymphocytes. I felt like I could understand it. I felt like it might be important. And you go with your instincts. So, what do you do when you feel like there's something there to discover, but you're the only one who sees it? As Bruce Spiegelman shares his story, he transports us from his quilted living room couch to a world of gene research. Join me as Bruce tells his story of how he didn't listen to the crowd and followed his hunch to discover the gene PGC1. His story begins with a case of high-profile embezzlement, but ultimately leads to serendipity and discovery. You've found Eureka. Okay, okay, all right, here, here we go then. Bruce Spiegelman is the Stanley Korsmeyer Professor at Harvard Medical School and the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston. Perched high atop the sleek, glass, Longwood Center building, Bruce's lab uses biochemical and genetic tools to discover key players in energy metabolism. For over 30 years, he and his lab have made fundamental discoveries in how cells control energy balance, heat generation, skeletal muscle metabolism, and cancer biology. A question actually that really I'm curious about, if you didn't know anything about a brand new gene that you came across, what would be the first experiment you would do to learn something about it? The first thing I would probably do is um, look at its regulation. I, I mean, just philosophically, I always believe, let the animal tell you what's going on. And so uh, before doing any gain or loss of function, I would probably look at where it's expressed, how it's expressed, how physiological perturbations like food intake, temperature, uh, movement affect its expression. And I first want the animal to tell me something about what that gene is associated with, what processes that gene was associated with. If you had to then crystallize in just a couple of sentences, what is the question that you really set out to answer? Well, we wound up answering something different than what we set out to answer. The question we were setting out to answer was, what are the dominant regulators of a cell deciding to be a thermogenic adipose cell as opposed to an energy storing adipose cell? Hold up. Let's describe a few things here. Bruce is talking about thermogenic adipose tissue versus adipose tissue that stores energy. The body has a special tissue type called fat tissue or adipose tissue that can take fat and store it, but it also has a special type of adipose tissue that can take fat and burn it. The burning fat releases heat as energy, and that's why we call it thermogenic. So Bruce talking about thermogenic adipose tissue also called brown adipose tissue, brown because it has a lot of mitochondria in it, or white adipose tissue. Because it's white, it doesn't have many mitochondria, and therefore will not burn, but rather store energy. The founding problem my lab had been working on was the regulation of white fat differentiation. And in about 1994, we kind of solved it to a first approximation. We identified PPAR gamma. We isolated PPAR gamma. PPAR gamma is a gene with a terrible name. It is the peroxone proliferator activated receptor gamma subtype, or more affectionately called PPAR gamma. This is a gene in the body that Bruce is talking about that controls several other gene expression events, which then is going to turn on 
several processes for energy storage. This is why PPAR gamma is so important in adipose tissue to store energy. So I was already thinking, okay, how do we evolve into the next phase? You know, everything says we found what we were looking for. Where are we going? And so thermogenic fat was of some interest to us already. We, we had isolated the first brown fat cell line, HYBE-1B, in 1991. And then a key moment came in about 1996 when Pede Pushavir came to my laboratory, who had a history in brown fat and was interested in working on brown fat. Now, how he came to my lab is a little bit of a story in itself. He uh, wrote to me in about 1996 and said, Dear Dr. Spiegelman, as you may know, um, the lab I am working in now, Professor So-and-so, is closing. And the reason the lab was closing is because his boss was arrested for embezzling funds. It was a lab at Harvard. It was a story in the newspapers. His boss was arrested and actually eventually did jail time, and his lab was closed. So Penny was in Boston in a Harvard laboratory, and he needed another place to work. He had a history of brown fat. And so he and I discussed whether there were common interests. And, you know, this was just about the time that I was being kind of open mentally to wanting to take a step out of white fat and its regulation. We came up with the idea of looking for the key regulator that made a cell decide to be a white fat cell or a brown fat cell. That was what we were actually working on when we discovered PGC1 alpha. So what was known in the literature at that time? PPR gamma was both necessary and sufficient to make a white fat cell. But the literature, some of it from us, some of it from other people, suggested that PPR gamma was also required for brown fat development. However, we knew, we had done these experiments way more than anybody else, we knew that it was not sufficient to get a brown fat cell. That if you take a fibroblastic cell and you express PPR gamma and you agonize it the way we agonized it then with ETYA or with some lipids. They're not very effective, but it was the best we had then. You always get a white fat cell. You never get a brown fat cell. It's 100% white. So PPR gamma is necessary and sufficient for white, necessary but not sufficient for brown. Obviously, we thought we were missing something. And so the experiment that Petty and I did was this following. I'm a protein biochemist, and so is he, as it happens. So what Petty did was immunoprecipitations from a brown fat cell. We had invented the line, type 1B, and a 3T3 fat cell, which was white, the Howard Green lines. And when we precipitated PPAR gamma, immunoprecipitated it, there came an extra band on the gel of 120,000 Daltons or something. And the experiment was repeated a lot. We always get this brown, this band, and we always get this extra band in brown fat cell line. We only had a couple, but yes, we always got a band. We set out to purify that band. We failed. We just couldn't get enough material. And remember that I, protein ID then would be by Edmund degradation. And you needed a lot of protein to do that. It was not very sensitive uh, and we couldn't do it. So let me get this straight. You have two cell lines, one that stores fat and one that burns fat. And the one that burns fat has a factor that you're looking for. And when you run it out on a gel in the lab, you can actually see it on the gel. But there's not enough material there because of the older techniques at the time in order to identify what it is. That must have been maddening. What did you do next? So in the lab, we were also doing on other projects, yeast two hybrid screening. And so we thought, okay, we know something about this. We know that at least in these white cells versus these brown cells, there's an extra band that interacts with gamma. So we made a brown fat cell, two hybrid library, yeast two hybrid library, and had a screened for clones that um, you could pull out with PPA or gamma as bait and showed this differential expression versus in white versus brown. 
and we got something. We had a bunch of splices and weird shit. And we just said, we'll take the biggest one, the full length, you know, the, the, the longest clone will assume that's the one. And that was full length PGC one alpha. And then we did gain a function and son of a gun, it turned on mitochondrial biogenesis and UCP one. So, wow, we didn't know what this thing was, but again, I emphasize it's different than what it turned out to be. We were looking for something that determines cells to be brown versus white. That is not what PGC1 alpha does. PGC1 alpha actually turns on, in a way, something more interesting. It turns on mitochondrial biogenesis and some other stuff. And what that other stuff is depends on what cell type you put it in. You know, over the years, it's turned out that this is, you know, a dominant slash master regulator of mitochondrial biogenesis. It's kind of funny because I wasn't in the mitochondrial world at that time. So it's a little weird that we were the ones to find this. On the other hand, it's not so weird because brown fat cells and and heart cells, cardiomyocytes, have the highest density of mitochondria of any cells in the body. So we were playing with a cell that has a super high mitochondrial density. And so by sort of studying the regulation of brown fat, we bumped into this. It was, and, and I think right from the start, we said, this is not determination. This is not turning the cells into brown fat cells. We didn't call it that. We said a cold inducer, cold inducible coactivator of thermogenesis or something like that in the title of the paper. But then every time we dropped it into a different cell, we got mitochondrial biogenesis plus other stuff, you know, and that other stuff turned out to be super interesting. Wow. What a journey. Can you imagine the struggle and then the excitement to overcome that? And this is just part one. We split this into two parts. So if this is interesting and you want to continue, go ahead. We'll serve up the next one immediately right after this to you. In the next part, Bruce is going to tell us about the studies that came after the initial discovery. And then also we're going to ask him to be forward looking. And what are the major questions surrounding PGC1 alpha biology? And lastly, we'll ask him for his advice and glean insight into how he thinks about scientific problems and scientific discovery. 